Fearless is a development company. What we want to do is we want to help people who want to do theater learn that process. So many of us in our lives make decisions about what we think we're going to do in college, and then later we find out we were wrong. Now, I actually have a degree in theater, but when I went into college, I thought I wanted to be an actor. By the time I left college, I thought I wanted to be a designer. And now I'm a playwright. And somehow, having a theater degree never taught me how to be a playwright. And having an engineering degree doesn't teach you how to do improvisational comedy. There are so many people that come to theater, some from within the theater community and some from outside the theater community, and they don't know how to get started. And that's what Fearless is about. Fearless is about giving those people an opportunity to explore comedy and to explore theater. And that's what Fearless Lab is. It's the first show that we ever did as a company. It is a monthly show. It happens every month. And it's happened every month since it started. And what it is, it's not an open mic in the traditional sense. It is a show in which anybody can ask for some time and walk up on that stage and do whatever. If they want to do stand-up for the first time ever, they can do stand-up for the first time ever. If they've got a new improv structure they want to try out, they can do a new improv structure they want to try out. In the past, Vilification Tennis, and maybe in the future, Vilification Tennis has used it for new people who haven't had an opportunity to really practice being a vilifier. They did the amateur show, and then five months later, they're in a regular stage show, and it gives them a chance to actually practice it in front of an audience. Those are the things that Fearless Lab has done, and it has been a really great thing for us to be able to give to the community, and it's a really great thing that we've been able to do for our members. So I hope you enjoy the next hour in which you're going to see a whole bunch of people trying things, trying comedy, maybe for the first time. And I'm going to introduce our host, who's another person who ended up trying to do something for the first time. So let's hear for Kayla. participation real quick. I need everybody to just, with me, not too fast, please, holy shit. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Mm. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm a phony. Can't present you with the tools when I ask you to blow me. A fake from a place with 10,000 lakes. I shake when they ask me to balance my place. They break when I drop them, but I can drop a beat. When I say things on stage, no good stage should repeat. And honestly, I don't even know how I got here. A couple little pushes of encouragement about two years ago from both Eric and Matt. And suddenly it's comedy and you are forced to hear me rap. I took over the show, said I could be its host. And I try to make the most of what I know from the host of the Brady's Go. <laughs> I don't know what I am doing. I don't mean to pretend. I don't want to be fine. I'll be a liar in the end. I'm just here with my jokes and my jokes on my own. Sitting on a stage and managing imposter syndrome. Oh, okay, let me tell you about that. This is my favorite fucking job that I ever have had. And I... And my favorite show. And yes, Eric, I know you can be a room away, but I can still feel your eye roll. But I'm here to talk about that. You are not here for double blind. You are here for fucking lab. And this is a show that is about to give a spotlight to fab new apps. So rad, ready to make you laugh. Yeah. And I just got to say, if you ever want to try this, throw an email my way. Because this shit runs from month to month at Honey Minneapolis. And it is super fun. Tuesday is the second one of every month that I've been up here too long. So I got to run. But welcome to lab. To me, the show represents the very heart of the company that we call Fearless. But that's just my humble opinion. Sit back and relax and watch these fucking acts of Bible and time show you what it means to be brave. And then next time, get your lovely ass up on the stage. I'm so excited to introduce our first act, Greenberry Gnome. Hi. Can you tell I've been here since Friday? No. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bryn. Um, this is my second stand-up in the last 27 years of my life. Uh, it's also the second stand-up in the last 24 hours. <laughs> it is fearless. Um, but good news, uh, you can help me redeem my first stand-up. Because you see, I have this ongoing fight with fearless that I'm not funny. And my first stand-up, the audience filled me and they laughed at me. So it is your job not to laugh at me, and then I can throw it in Eric Thompson's face that I am not funny, okay? Stop it. So, um, I 
actually have uh, sung a song here at Lab before, um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about it. The song was a uh, parody of When Will My Life Begin? Um, so part of my life story is Rapunzel. Um, tell me if this sounds familiar uh, or along the same lines. When I was 11, uh, or when I was 11, I got diabetes. When I was 13, I got something called posterior orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, called POTS. Yeah, I was a pothead. Never had weed, but I was a pothead. Uh, and then um, it also, it includes when you stand up, you get really dizzy. Your heart rate shoots up, your blood pressure goes down, and you drop like a rock. Um, but that also means that it is really hard to think. My biggest symptom was brain fog. Uh, and so when I went to school, I would start to get dizzy and I wouldn't be able to think. And so I had to stay home with my mom. Now my mom and my dad had, been had started to get separated. So I was at home with my mom from the time that I was in, should have been in eighth grade to when I was 18. Uh, during that time, I didn't go to school. Uh, I was with my mom who didn't always say really kind things. She would typically say um, that bad things about my dad or bad things about me and different things like that starting to sound familiar. Yeah. Uh, so what's really, what's really great is that in uh, other stories that we find, in fairy tales that we find, we can find truth. Um, really great stories about being able to be, uh, to free yourself, to choose to leave a bad situation. But sometimes they get some of the things wrong, um, like Prince Charming. Mm -mm, no, I grew up in Manassas, Virginia. Um, it's about an hour out of D.C. It's a commuter city. Um, the only thing that I was able to get out of the tower for was theater, and so I knew some theater kids. Um, I had three possible suitors for my Flynn Rider. Uh, the first one was my first official boyfriend. Uh, he was... Uh, tall, gangly, black eyeliner, totally digged it, still do, but uh, he wouldn't come outside of the house to see me for three months. Role reversal. Uh, the second one was uh, somebody who moved away to New Mexico and wouldn't respond to my messages unless he broke up with his girlfriend, and then he'd be messaging me. Uh, yeah. Uh, third suitor was someone who we had flirtations back and forth, but then uh, he said right before he moved to Seattle that if it, he wasn't still in love with his ex, he would totally like me. So I'm really glad I didn't find my Flynn Rider. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, since then, since I've come to Minnesota and I've healed a lot, I, I have found a partner, which is fabulous. But, um, so, number one, don't always go for the first guy who finds you in a tower. <laughs> uh, number two, man, she has a really big vocabulary for somebody who's been stuck in a tower. Um, I understand Disney has to be able to tell the actual story, but she had four books. <laughs> Four books. She uh, and her mother learned, taught her how to read. My mom taught me some things during that time. Um, but I, because of this, I literally missed high school. So the fact that she didn't get to go out and get socialized, and the fact that she didn't get, get to go and get an education, really really hits home for me. Um, I spent four years learning how to forget when other kids were learning how to remember. Um, I constantly had to have a loop of forgetting. So I'm really wondering how that worked out for her when it's her entire life, just keeping it real a little bit. Um, and then lastly, that first song. <laughs> that first motherfucking song. Like I started to get uh, uh, flashbacks of my life when I finally saw Tangled. I was outside of my mom's house and I got flashbacks of my life. But when I was in my mom's house, when I saw it, but it didn't really occur to me that that first fucking song was so off until I saw it the second time and I realized how much I uh, connected with it. That first song, she is so fucking happy. She's so fucking happy and productive. When you are stuck in the middle of uh, not being able to go out or do anything, she makes cookies, she teaches herself guitar, she does, there's a lot going on there. And I don't think it quite represents what it's like to be locked up in a tower. So I fixed it. <laughs> uh, 
this might turn into spoken word poetry because of my voice. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best. <clears throat> 7 a.m. and maybe I can finally sleep now. Stayed up all night with nocturnal tendencies. I'd been planning to use last night, but somehow I couldn't get myself to get to my feet. I couldn't read a book, though I have two or three. Creative expression is now so hard for me. I play guitar on it or cook, but basically, that's just not how depression works. Why use up spoons when you know that you'll, they'll just run out? No one will see my art on my walls anyway. Maybe some friends will someday somehow reach out. But why bother when my mom won't say it's okay? My body would be keen to find some dopamine. Due to my crazy mind, mom, the supply's been so lean. And when you brush it off and say just go for a walk, try being locked inside of a tower for four years without having hardly any human co uh, conversation or interaction. And then you can tell me to go for a walk. <laughs> Tomorrow night, the lights will appear just like they do on my birthday each year. What is the world like? I literally don't know. Now that I'm older, mother might just let me go. But we've been through this for 18 years, and we all know that will never really come true. And now I'm sad again, my depression's renewed. I guess I'll just sit here and maybe wait for food. <laughs> no high school transcript. I got my GED. I took my ACT and got a score that I didn't deserve. I started going to community college. I got a four-year degree at Bethel University. Uh, I started performing in theater, and now here I am in Fearless. Sometimes Disney does get some things right. something new every time I do lab, and uh, I, I'm actually going to be doing something that's old to other people, and that is white guys explaining their opinions about things. Uh, and I've avoided political commentary for a long time because, one, like people don't need more from people like me, and two, uh, the reason, well, I'll just skip to the reason that I'm getting into it, and that is that a lot of people who start their sets like, well, you know, I'm white and my opinions, uh, they immediately go into, like, the why they feel attacked, and I think that's shitty. And so my brave thing today is talking about my opinions, and if I hurt anybody's feelings sincerely, that is not my intention, and I hope that you will talk to me because I will always want to be a better person. So, uh, we are starting here. All right. Um, I hate the phrase playing devil's advocate. It once meant that you were presenting an argument from a position that you oppose, but I guess it's the new, I promise, or, I promise that you won't get mad if I say this, or I'm not racist, but. 
I'm saying it more and more to preface the views of the extreme right, which means that the person recognizes that they're saying something most people find racist, sexist, or LGBTQIA-phobic and want to sound more reasonable than the belief that they're professing. What I find funny is that they're doing it by saying, uh, you know, Christian religion has this personification of evil in our world. Uh, don't think ill of me, but I'm taking his side in this argument. <laughs> Just real quick for a second to see how it feels. I tend to be pretty superstitious and at least a little ignorant and hypocritical, but I mean well and I hope that people see that. I try to be understanding and allow for the same in others in exchange and look for their intentions. It can be too much, though, especially when it hurts other people, people that I love. There's a phenomenon called the tolerance paradox. And does anybody know about the tolerance paradox? Yes. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, for those who maybe don't, uh, you get to be one of today's 10,000 that learned something new. Um, it is when society reaches peak tolerance and has to either tolerate hate groups as free speech or condemn them because they are against tolerance. Does, does that make sense? I, and it's, it can be a hard choice for a tolerant society, but remember that someone else is forcing us to select between two kinds of intolerance. Someone is forcing us to choose either intolerance that is hatred or intolerance that is based in kindness and in inclusivity, and I choose the latter, which is disposing of hate groups or not allowing hate speech. Um, with that in mind, I'm hoping that uh, lovingly pointing out hypocrisy and inconsistency will help. So I've created something I call them, but also them. Are you familiar with the me, but also me thing where it's like, me, I'm just going out for one drink, also me. Where did that bottle of Malort go? <laughs> also, I believe I have Malort poisoning, which is any amount of malort. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, them. I hate these YouTube ads. I don't want any of their stuff, and I'm sick of seeing the same thing over and over. Also, them. I have sent you my penis. Please respond. <laughs> them. I don't want Sharia law. Their religion doesn't belong in my government. Also, them. How dare atheists remove the Ten Commandments from the courthouse? <laughs> Them. Feminists need to stop policing my language. Also them. I don't think they should be allowed to say bad things about men. <laughs> right, okay, I'm glad. We're getting the hang of this, all right. Uh, them. We need a smaller government that leaves people free to govern themselves. Also them. We need the president to make homosexual marriage a crime. <laughs> Does it fucking make sense? I'm glad we're talking about it. All right. Uh, them. A large number of gun deaths are just a product of our failure to introduce our children to proper firearm safety at a young age so that they'll be respectful of them. It should be mandatory for all kids to at least learn the basics so that they don't make a life-changing mistake since it is likely that they will at some point have access to a gun. Also them. Abstinence only is fine. <laughs> Them. Our genes are superior to all others. Also them. They're committing genocide by breeding us out. <laughs> this is something that they, they believe both of those things, and that's nuts. All right. Uh, but I, like, for me, for me personally, I do have one racist stereotype that I can't get rid of, and it's that the kind of people who draw swastikas on bathroom walls are, and again, I know this is a stereotype about racists, are also the kind of people who can't draw swastikas. <laughs> and I'm torn between the urge to correct someone who is that wrong and leaving it as a testament to their stupidity. <laughs> they just end up looking like a spider who got away four times, but not the fifth. Just wham! Got it. <laughs> it's difficult to adapt, though, and it means throwing away most of our jokes and favorite movies for good ones. I'm, I'm sorry, it's rough, I know. Uh, I, I was raised in a really sexist, racist, homophobic time within the last 5,000 years, but especially the last 50. Yeah. People are really fighting over whether it's safe to have somebody poop in the same room based on something that is none of their business. Yeah. I, I, which is fucking unfathomable. 
What they're really worried about is that things we identify as LGBTQIA+, will become normalized. And I, I understand that fear, because those things are fucking normal. <laughs> fucking normal. Like, all joking aside, they want to police gender and sexuality because they know there's no difference, and they are worried about themselves. Not kids, not neighbors, not the Muslims themselves. Without rigidly defined McCarthy-era ideology, they might be attracted to anyone and have to consider what that means about them and what does it mean. What does it mean to be open to those possibilities? Well, it, I mean, that could result in lifelong happiness, and that is the real enemy of the Catholic Church. <laughs> In, in that spirit, I would love to make a movie that terrifies them. Uh, it's, it's a parody of World War Z. It's called World War G. In which people don't become zombies, they become fabulously gay stereotypes. Yeah. <laughs> right? I, it's like, have you been bitten? Well, I got away. Rubs glitter on cheekbones. <laughs> have you been bitten? No, no, why are you focused on this? drapes feather boa on shoulders. <laughs> but it's, uh, like, uh, the trailer would be, you know, all of that, and then it would be World War G, coming to a theater near you. But it, it's a theater, okay? Like, bitch, please. It's, it's already fucking here. <laughs> Oh my god. I love it when, uh, lab is one of my favorite things because people get to try new things um, and people get to try new jokes and make, you know, commentary on actual real wonderful things and I'm just, I'm so pleased, I'm baffled and happy and oh my god. Okay, please, welcome to the stage, Heather Zesta! <laughs> Zestera. I haven't always been a Zestera. Hi, Kyle. Hello. How are you? I'm well. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. You got it? All right, we're good. All right. <laughs> so I didn't start out as a Zestera. My original name, and I say original because fuck the patriarchy, but my original name was Redessel, and it is spelled exactly like it sounds. R-I-E-D-E-S-E-L. Fuck you, it's German. That is how it was raised. German is the end-all, be-all. It's beautiful. Let's skip over the bad parts. <laughs> but most importantly, nobody can spell your fucking name. So I went through school as Heather, um, here. That's me. So <laughs> when I was 10, uh, my parents took me and my sibling to Germany, you know, where we didn't speak the language, and the only people we could talk to was each other. I had my Tiffany tape, and Jamie was reading a book and not looking at the Alps, because why would you look at the Alps? I could see them with my headphones on. So the point of this trip was to go to the castle that had our family crest. It's like, you know, So there I am, 10-year-old me and all of my positive glory. And we walk in, and there it is. Hey, hey, Dad, 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 Dad. Why is there a donkey with a thistle in its mouth? We flew all this way for what? <laughs> oh, yes, did you not know? Our name translates to Swamp Donkey. <laughs> myself to all of my neighbors, because I'm a social butterfly like that, knocking on their door and spelling my name. I would have understood to not do that if you just explained to me that I was telling them I was a small donkey. <laughs> so from that point forward, you know, there's the, the stereotype of, of girls dreaming of their weddings and dresses and flowers. I was dreaming of paperwork. Because damn it, I was not going to be a swamp donkey for the rest of my life. <laughs> In high school, I made the decision. If I am not married by the time my lovely Rita Silgrams passed, because I did adore them, I would change my name come hell or high water. So thankfully, I got married. Thankfully, I got married before they passed. And <laughs> my last name became Heather Keen. 
Simple, easy, right? K E E N. Um, ma'am, is that spelled with an E on the end? No. <laughs> it's keen. Um, that's K U E H N E, right? No! <laughs> it's keen, like peachy. <laughs> achieved everything. A house, a husband, a spellable name. That didn't work out. So <laughs> when I got divorced from my lovely ex-husband, he's a very decent human being, I asked, please don't make me be a swamp donkey again. I don't want to be a swamp donkey. And they very kindly said, sure, keep the name. What do I care? Fast forward to two months later, and he met Heather number two. <laughs> Not my fault. I asked permission. So they eventually got married. And before they got married, she got very irritated at me for keeping the name. And I was like, bitch, I was here first. <laughs> Your last name was easy to spell to begin with. I'm winning. I am keeping the win. You cannot take this from me. So the funny thing about post-divorce is I moved every year for about three years. And when you move and you put your forwarding order in, it becomes retroactive. So when Heather became Heather Key number two, I started getting her mail. I'm pretty sure she defaulted on a loan. Um, but she's a lovely, lovely girl. We became Facebook friends because I still had a step cat in common with um, my first husband. And um, one of the things that I got in the mail, which I didn't really think anything about, was, you know, a pure romance catalog. You know, everybody needs help. Um, and then one day, I get home from work and I check my Facebook and there's an invite from Heather Keen to a pure romance party. Real, real, really? Do you want me, me, at your pure romance party? Um, yeah, I know why Heather is totally hosting this because I was here first and there's a reason why I'm not married anymore, so I totally get her endorsement. Oh. Yeah, no, I didn't do that, but that's been my shtick ever since. <laughs> so when I met my new spouse and I was looking on to become not keen, because believe me, that was just more trouble than it needed to be worth. Still spellable, but trouble. I invited my ex to the wedding, and he says to me, don't you think it would be awkward to have your first husband at your wedding that we were having in a bar? <laughs> and I said, would that be more or less awkward than your first wife being at a sex toy party with your new wife? <laughs> Long pause on the phone. She did what? <laughs> and I was like, I didn't go, you're welcome. <laughs> Whatever. So I am now married and I am now Zastero, which is not the easiest to spell, and it translates assumedly to apron, which is better than a swamp donkey, not as peachy as peachy but also no Heather number two. And I'm 32 years old and this is my second stand-up and feel this is the best thing to ever happen to all of these people. Speaking of names, um, we do have a, a head of number two, actually. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage, Head of G, Matt McKay! I think I might prefer Heather number two from now on. <laughs> contributions to the public consciousness in a manner that perpetuates a very specific blight. 
I write dumbass tweets several times a day and embarrassingly have been doing so for over a decade. <laughs> for those with both dignity and a life, allow me to provide context. Twitter is known for being a cesspool bachelor pad of a website for the very worst corners of society. Actual Nazis, MRAs and incels, which for those of you who are like less online, uh, it means dudes that nobody wants to fuck who have basically unionized. <laughs> and not to be redundant, the cur current president of the United States, whose name I won't utter, lest my teeth turn to dust and locusts come pouring out of my mouth. <laughs> Beyond that, Twitter is little more than a place to scream into the void, and boy do I. I'm here to, as the kids were saying four years ago, but don't anymore, declare sorry not sorry about my stupid tweets. On the plus side, I use a pseudonym, but mostly because of the nature of my work, I work in government, please don't look me up, which requires me to be publicly nonpartisan. Almost an impossible feat in 2019. In fact, I recently learned that it was probably partisan and also unoriginal, tired, and honestly just not funny, words directly lifted verbatim from a recent reproach I received in said office from my real life boss wow. to post the glamour shots of Paul Ryan working out in his basement when he, when he announced he wasn't running for re-election and calling him a creep-ass weirdo who drinks natty ice. <laughs> Agree to disagree, but criticism duly noted. Apparently, it is also partisan to tweet, Lindsey Graham is a Keebler elf-ass looking bitch. <laughs> or, in a demonstration of a complete inability to reach across the aisle, as it were, catching dysentery from the shit particles on your fingers to own the libs, when we learned about that guy on Fox News who had not washed his hands in 19 years. <laughs> it's real. That's a real thing. My tweets are topical, but only about dumb stuff. Mitt Romney blowing out his candles weird? I will rapid fire nine tweets about it. A contestant on The Bachelor refers to testicles as beeps. <laughs> A threaded conversation with myself spanning several hours. <laughs> Additional problematic exhibits include the host of Unsolved Mysteries definitely fucks. <laughs> These are real tweets. Thanos looks like a walnut. <laughs> and why wasn't Josh Hartnett cast as Aragorn, which rightfully lost me eight followers in one hour <laughs> and couldn't be any further from any sort of current event at all. My tweets are also mean. Just saw a grown woman high five a cop and puked myself to death. <laughs> A reply asking if that's partisan. It might be. <laughs> Parents who refer to their children as their date to an event, oh, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> Tweeted with a string of no less than nine question marks. Stop fucking snowing, bitch. Self-explanatory. <laughs> wow, brown rice sucks ass. <laughs> Go fuck yourself, sorry, if you don't make peanut butter blossom cookies at Christmas, which my husband, unprompted, referred to as not your best work, hun. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, all Starbursts taste the same, don't at me. <laughs> Highlighting a persistent refusal to engage in meaningful discourse and also holding opinions that are objectively incorrect. <laughs> Once on a first date, a man told me to stop dumbing myself down, and my response was then and remains now, literally, I will fucking never. And the I is lowercase. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we have...
have um, we have the next person coming up. I'm very excited because um, they recently did lab for the first time. I didn't get to be there, and I was really uh, really bummed. Um, and so now I'm I'm so pleased because I actually get to see their set. Please welcome to the stage Jake Bird. Yeah! <laughs> About that. So Kayla um, posted on Facebook and said that she needed some performers for Fearless Lab. And I said, sure, I can do that. The day before Fearless Lab, I found out Kayla's not even going to be there. That, I believe, is, what is that, the bait and switch? I think it's illegal, um, but never mind. So uh, I am Jake. It has been 20 days for, since my first appearance at Fearless Lab. Uh, this, thank you. Uh, James, I know you're out there because I can hear you laughing. How many people are out there because I can see none of them? Uh, okay, that's great. Let's not talk about that ever again. That was so, funny. Uh, so, this is my second appearance at Fearless Lab. This is also my fourth appearance for Die Laughing. And my... Yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, and it has been 12 hours since my last comedy, thank you. Um, which is really kind of a surprise because uh, I never considered myself funny in like a capital C comedy sort of way. Uh, but the problem is, is that I keep volunteering to do things. Uh, and the real issue in that I've done four comedies since Friday night is that uh, past me is the one that is agreeing to do comedy things and is volunteering future me to do it and then doesn't tell present me and then present me and future me converge, and then it's too late. Um, but, you know, even though I'm not a member of Fearless, I know that Fearless is very important. It does a lot for our community for, uh, obviously, Fearless Lab, right? It's bringing people into the scene and giving them an opportunity to try things out. Um, and obviously, Die Laughing is very important as their primary fundraiser of the year, and I know this for a fact because it's been the only thing on my Facebook feed for the last 20 days. <laughs> I have good friends. Um, you know, and it's just, it's so easy to, to know things nowadays, right, with the internet. Um, but that's not always, that's, this is a good thing for me right now, but it's not always a good thing. Do you ever like um, WebMD, right? Do you ever go onto WebMD and you think that you just like pulled a muscle or something and then you find out you have something called, and I'm gonna recite this from memory, fibro, fibro dysplasia ossificans progressiva and all of your soft tissue is turning to bone. Oh. Yeah, me either. Um, but <laughs> but uh, but I do go on and check out the symptoms of all of my brain things because in the last like ten years I've been diagnosed with a lot of acronyms. So like MDD, GAD, DPD, BPD, ADHD, the other BPD, and OCPD, and the list just kind of goes on from there. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out what my brain is doing. And uh, you know when you go and you look at the diagnostic criteria, it's all Greek. Um, and not formatted in a way that makes sense. Um, and what's crazy is there's, and you're looking at all of your list of symptoms, right? It's like uh, when you go on Amazon and you select a bunch of items and you can compare them all next to each other. You're doing that, but with your mental health. Um, and all of the symptoms kind of sound kind of similar. And they're just, it's not written in a way that makes any kind of sense. Uh, and it's also, as it turns out, all of that information is uh, compiled by committee not, you know, based on like any scientific facts or, you know, any concept of biology or the environment, you know, we're just gonna all sit down and talk about it. And of course, these are all, you know, uh, administrators, not necessarily even doctors, but whatever. Um, the University of Minnesota actually a couple of years ago uh, collaborated on a project where they created a new system of diagnosing uh, mental health um, and mood disorders, right? Uh, which they called high top, which is spelled H-I-T-O-P. You can Google that, it's really cool. Uh, where instead of saying like, here's a list of symptoms, and if you have some of these symptoms, you might have this disorder. On the other hand, if you have some of these symptoms, you might also have this disorder. Because in that system, I can have the same five uh, symptoms as somebody else, and we could be diagnosed with different disorders. We can also have the same disorder diagnosis and share no symptoms in common. And that is totally medically sound. Um, the high top system is a little bit different in that it creates a spectrum. So, for example, on a nervousness spectrum, 
a normal, right, shall we say, the, the non-problematic side of nervous is like, maybe some people would be nervous getting on a stage and talking to a completely black room full of faces. Um, and on a, more, uh, on a more problematic side of that, or, um, you know, kind of something that you would seek treatment for is maybe you have that same level of fear when you have to get on the city bus. Um, depending on what city bus, maybe that's justifiable, but you know, neither here nor there. Um, to get back to the comedy aspect of that, um, one of the symptoms that I kept seeing on there um, was impulse control issues, right? Uh, and I was sitting there reading this and I'm thinking to myself, well, that's like, you know, there's like gambling or like um, uh, not safe sex or like buying a bunch of cake and eating it and then that's just all you do for the next three weeks. And so I don't really struggle with that. Um, pizza roll is a different issue, but that's, that's <laughs> don't judge me. Um, but so, you know, I'm sitting there and everything else kind of makes sense, you know, like sleep. I don't know what's going on with sleep. Am I getting too much? Am I getting too little? I just feel tired all the time, but I'm super bad at it. Sure would like to sleep someday. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes I also uh, make up scenarios in my brain that would never, ever exist. And I get super, super upset about it. Um, like, for example, I am never going to meet Julius Caesar. That's just not going to happen. But I think about it quite a lot. Um, <laughs> I took Latin for three years and that was perhaps a mistake. <laughs> um, but you know, the impulse control, I didn't really understand. Uh, and then it was Monday night and a friend of mine, uh, this last just Monday that just happened, uh, a friend of mine is uh, kind of lamenting that he doesn't feel like he's in control of himself as a person. You know, he's getting ready to graduate college and so he's gonna go off in the real world and do real world things and he's just super freaked out about that. And there are changes that he wants to make, but he's worried, what if he makes those changes and they suck, uh, and they're really permanent, and what, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm like, okay, well, easy solution, just go get a piercing, man. If you don't like the piercing, you can just take it out, and like, there'll be a little bit of a scar, but you're probably not gonna die. Tuesday afternoon, I got two piercings. Um, and so I've been walking around with a black eye since Wednesday, uh, and all of my friends and their good, good, gracious natures have never pointed it out to me until I brought it up first, because I guess it doesn't surprise them that I have a black eye. I'm like, Equal parts fear and fight. Uh, I have two modes. One is fear and the other is kill it. Um, so, uh, and I lean towards kill it because fear is uncomfortable. Um, but so after this, and I wake up Wednesday morning uh, after trying to um, figure out how to sleep because I can't sleep on this side of my face. There's pieces of metal in my eyebrow. Can't sleep on this side. There's metal in my ear. So I just suffered all night. Uh, and I wake up and I think to myself, huh? Maybe I should have considered that for more than 16 hours. Um, maybe I should have done one and then the other, because it's not that I regret getting these piercings. I had independently thought of both of them for periods of time over the last couple of years, but doing them at the same time was perhaps foolish. Um, and then I started thinking, you know, do I have impulse control issues? What have I done in my life? Uh, I enlisted in the army when I was 17. That was a mistake. Um, I moved from Texas to Minnesota after six months of contemplation. That was a good choice. Uh, and then uh, and then I keep like volunteering to do comedy things, which is going pretty well, because I mean, worst case scenario, I suck and it's funny, and you guys have a great time, and I just drink heavily and forget. Um, good news, I haven't been drinking at all. I'm like, and some of you are going to ask, but hey, you look like you're 12. You shouldn't be drinking anyways. I'm 26, thanks. Um, and that didn't stop James from giving me malort weeks ago. And yes, I am still bitter about it. Um, but that's fine. I am. Thank you for your validation. I do like to be validated. Um, and uh, part of that is that uh, I have always been so afraid of losing things that I have been unwilling to risk losing it to get something that I want slightly more. And so going into this year, I resolved myself to be chaotically creative once a month. And I left that intentionally vague because I didn't know what I was going to do. So uh, in January, I signed up for a sword and shield class, which is why I was, which is why I'm the last one uh, on stage tonight, because I was late. Um, and then in uh, February, what, I was about to say Tuesday, the second day of the year. Um, <laughs> yep, that's a different symptom on the list of acronyms. Um, so January, swords, uh, Tuesday, February, tattoo, March, comedy, 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 comedy. Uh, and I'm concerned about how am I going to top this in April? Because, like, nothing really happens in April except for, like, income taxes, but I already did that. 
So I, um, I think, guys, I think the only thing I can do is like actually try to apply to be part of Fearless. <laughs> oh yeah, so, so shout out to Bryn, who as soon as I said I was doing Fearless Lab, immediately was like, that's super great, let me know when you apply for Fearless, and she just has not let up. Um, peer pressure is a very good way to get me to do things. Um, on that note, I'm gonna I'm gonna time myself out. Uh, I'll let you know if that maneuver works. Uh, in the meantime, remember that supporting local community theater and comedy productions is absolutely punk rock. Kayla, get me out. Oh my god! Oh my god! I love this show so much. We got another one. <laughs> Speaking of. Um, my, my first uh, time ever doing stand-up was actually at, at, at this show, at Die Laughing at Lab, two years ago, um, because one Matt Alex tricked me um, into doing it. Um, so, seeing as I have, I think, six minutes, um, I kind of want some payback to happen. Hey, Matt, are you out there in the audience? Come up here. And <laughs> You're like, bitch, bitch. Where are we going? <laughs> uh, how long? Six minutes? Yeah. Okay, do you want to time with the scabs the clown story? So let's do something else. Uh, hmm. Tell you what, let me tell you a story about true love. Uh, I used to work at the Renaissance Festival, and uh, I spent a lot of time hanging out at the Irish Cottage, a uh, small little place with the pet and zoo near it. And uh, there was a night that uh, the Dregs, that you just saw a couple hours ago, uh, were performing their annual Dregs After Dark show. And uh, the, the lovely folks who were running Irish Cottage at the time, Taffy and Becca, had never seen the Dregs because they were busy all day and could never go see the show. And I said, guys, you need to go. This is after hours. You don't have to be here to perform. And they said, well, yeah, but we have to clean up the dishes and do all the stuff. I said, no, no, no. I tell you what, I will get a bunch of people to help take care of that when it's over. Go see the show. You'll love it. And they... Fine. They finally, you know, said okay. And we went to the show. They had a great time. They loved it, as of course anyone who's seen the Drakes does. And we get back. And uh, by the way, at this time I was uh, hosting the free beer shows, which meant I had 16, 18, 25 cases of free beer at the end of any given day, which I would then hand out to other people and myself. <laughs> so I'm very drunk, <clears throat> and it's about mm, one in the morning. So we come back, and I'm uh, given the task of scrubbing out the cast iron stuff in the uh, yard outside the Irish cottage. And after about a half hour, Taffy comes out and goes, how's it going out here? And I go, huh? And that's when I realize I've not done anything. I've just been standing there staring at the moon. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you good, buddy? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. So he goes back in. And I go, I got to pee. So I leave. So about two hours later, they start to get real worried because <laughs> I haven't come back. They send Taffy to look for me. Taffy finds me standing outside of the blit, the, this is the kind of the after hours hangout of everybody. And I'm right on the line where like the halo of light is and I'm just kind of weaving. <laughs> and Taffy comes up and goes, hey man, how you doing? I go, what? Oh, hey, Taffy. He goes, what, what you doing? I go, oh. He goes, hey, are you drunk? I go, oh. <laughs> so you should go to bed, huh? I go, yeah. Hi. Oh, okay, can I help you to your campsite? I go, oh. And so Taffy kindly walks me from the blit down the uh, staircase back to the campground at the Tosh Tent where I stayed with uh, Porter and my, at that time, wife, Greta. And uh, he gets me there and he's like, okay, buddy, we're at your tent. Are you gonna, you're good? I go, oh. And he's, you're going to stay here, though, right? You're not going to go anywhere else or anything because we've been looking for you for like two hours. I go, yep, it's right here. I might have to puke, but if I puke, I'll just puke off the side of the tent and it's right here. And he goes, okay. So he leaves. And I get undressed to go to bed and I go, nope. Here comes that puke I was talking about. So I take one of the Rubbermaid toes to keep her costumes in, and I take the lid off, and I dump all the costuming out, and I'm barfing it. And then I put the lid back on, going, deal with it in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
That's how I remember it. <laughs> the next morning, I wake up, oddly fresh as a daisy. I'm a guy that is just such an asshole I don't get hangovers. Uh, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, hey, the Lord might be the deal breaker. We'll find out. Uh, but I, I, I wake up just like, oh, fuck me, that was a weird night, right? And Greta just goes, and poor goes, yeah. I go, what? Well, I was mostly right. Taffy did find me weaving outside of the blit. And he did walk me back to my tent. And I did promise I would stay there. And stay there, I did. I, you know, I try to be a man of my word. Um, so, when I said, I'm going to stay here and go to bed, but I might have to throw up, I was right. Uh, when I got undressed for bed, Apparently what that meant was I did this, and then just flopped down on the floor. <laughs> and then, when I was like, uh-oh, I gotta puke, and took that rubber toe and dumped all the shit out of it and puked and put the lid on, what that meant was going, <clears throat> So, I've now puked on the next two days worth of costuming. Not only mine, but my wife's. And I'm still wearing all the clothes I was wearing, and I'm taking off a shoe. <laughs> now, like I said, this is a story of real love. Because what happened is, they came back down to the tent after doing all the work I should have been doing back at the cottage, and found me laying there. Oh god, this didn't used to take so long. <laughs> laying there, like this, watch you off. And, you know, despite our differences now, my ex was kind enough to go, oh, I've got to fix this, and took off the other shoe. <laughs> and then she went and undid my belt, at which point I went, I don't even know you. I'm married. <laughs> Upon hearing this at, you know, 7.30 in the morning before cast call, uh, she was, there's not a word for how pissed you can be, <laughs> and yet was also going, but s still though, I mean, you didn't even know where you were, and you were going, nope. <laughs> so I guess, yay? <laughs> so, we make our way back up to cast call. Uh, so early in the morning, we're walking our way up to the bakery stage where, where Cass called it happened at the time, where uh, the uh, Danger Comedian stuff performs, if you've ever been there. And I'm walking up, and I, at this point, it's starting to settle in, and I would like to be dead. Um, and I know my best bet is if I can peel off to my left and go to the big white tent where there are the wine shows and the tea stuff and all that, and go find my friend Trampy Smurf, she will have whiskey and cigarettes, and that will fix everything. And so I begin to peel away from Porter and Greta, and I hear from the stage, the entertainment director go, Anybody seen Matt Alex? Anybody? And I go, mm -hmm. <laughs> And I keep walking towards the stage. Now, everyone has turned in their seats. This is 300 people on the cast. Have all turned in there and goes, Oh. <laughs> There's an audible, oh. <laughs> You all right? Ready for opening gate? <laughs> Thud. I probably sat next to either uh, Tim Wick or Pedantic Eric. You, you guys probably remember this day. Uh, there it is. <laughs> and I, I sit through cast call, and I go to fucking opening gate, and I do my time, and the moment no one's paying attention, I run off, and I go back behind Gypsy stage and get very, very drunk with uh, um, Tastes Like Burning. Uh, and later on, I talk to Carl, the gym director, and I go, dude, the fuck? And he goes, what? I go, why'd you call me out? And he goes, I don't know. Like, I was drunk as fuck. Weren't you trying to make fun of me? He goes, nah. I just saw you walking and picked your name. <laughs> cool, bro. <laughs> cool. So, what I'm saying is, if you're going to make a lot of poor decisions, you might as well use them as comedy fodder. 
and there's no better place to use that as comedy fodder than Fearless Lab, which you can do on the second Tuesday of every month at Honey and Minneapolis. All you have to do is ask. There's no pay to play, there's a lot more time to get your average open mic, and you don't have to do anything else except try to be funny. Which I hope I've done. <laughs>